May I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm guessing that we all have a natural inclination towards perfection, purity, the unblemished. At the supermarket, we tend to meticulously inspect the peaches, the bananas, and our eyes will guide our choices. We select the ones without bruises, leaving the rest. And I wonder whether you've ever known what it's like to be the last one to be picked, whether you've ever known what it's like not to be the one selected for a team or never invited to the party, the stone the builders cast aside. We live today in an age when many people are interested in their ancestors and researching them. Some people are interested in their families for all kinds of reasons. Others are looking for hope and they're looking for answers. But rejection taps into our most profound feelings of unworthiness, of being peripheral or useless, can make us feel like an outsider, unwanted, unlovable. So it's good to remember that God begins his work not in the center of things, but on the edges. God begins on the edge of a forgotten province, which is on the edge of an overextended empire. Philip, who we heard about earlier, asks, can anything good come from Nazareth? That's the reject counter of the Roman Empire. It's got nothing good in it but God sees it differently. That's why Jesus in his adult life chooses to spend time on the fringes of society. The term provincial barely begins to describe where Jesus is from. God delights in working from the edges. God revels in working with that kind of material. And Paul encourages us to be open-minded and compassionate about our faith, mindful that it comes from the root and the stump of Jesse. Sometimes it can be quite challenging, can't it, to try and discern the connection between the three readings and the psalm on a Sunday. But today it really couldn't be clearer. It's all about rejection, and it's about God's choice to come alongside us and to live with us, to graft us in, to adopt us, to count us as heirs in God's family, to abide with us. The Ethiopian eunuch is unable to worship inside the temple in Jerusalem or to have any children due to his status as a eunuch. But here we see in Acts, he's grafted into the new community of faith through baptism. Psalm 22 is probably the most powerful hymn of rejection and desolation and annihilation, the words uttered by Jesus on the cross. And yet the psalm concludes with us being incorporated into the love of God. 1 John 4 reminds us that the true love of true religion is found in nurture, not nature. It's something that we must practice. Faith is not inherited, but it is a gift that we can all receive. In the letter to the Romans, Paul speaks of us as being grafted into the life of God when we're baptized. The Holy Spirit has taken us part of the wild vine and taken Adam 
and grafted him into the true vine, which is Jesus. And as long as we are in that, we live. And as the vine sends sap and nutriments to the branches, so Christ Jesus gives you his righteousness, his love, and his life. As the Jewish mystics are fond of saying, God has no grandchildren. It's the heart of the gospel. You don't get faith or grace through the family line or through a marital union. The gospels tell us that we are all children of God and God asks us to adopt by faith others in return to be an adopting and a fostering agency, which becomes a sign of the kingdom of God. I think we know why God starts on the edges rather than in the middle. It's because Jesus is the love of God in human form. He doesn't go to a high-powered seminary he doesn't go to a top university. He moves the chairs and watches the floors being swept and says his Shabbat prayers. The Gospels tell us that Jesus made his home among us. He dwelt with us. That Jesus made his home among us in order that we might be at home with him for eternity. Jesus says, I've come to be with you here and now so you can be with me for eternity. The Gospels constantly remind us that we cannot inherit this grace. We cannot inherit salvation or ordination. God is not really that interested in the longevity of our lineage but God does care an awful lot about how we act in the world and the good that we can do. That's why God is constantly confounding the wisdom of the world and using the foolish, the marginalized, those on the reject counter to bring us to our senses, to melt our hearts, and to remind us that God is only God if God is for everyone. We all belong to the family of God as adoptees, as foster children, and we're asked to carry that in our lives, our love, and in our witness. So, this question of the true vine, the one that we're grafted into, the one that we are called to be part of so we can be fruitful. Does it matter whether we're pure or what? Is faith weighed by what we are or what we produce? A long time ago, a bishop, more than a hundred years ago, in some of the uh, darkest days of the 20th century, had this to say, writing about the hope for the world. It's a kind of parable, and it goes like this. As the threats of war and the cries of humanity were sounding in our ears, we fell into an uneasy sleep. In our sleep, we dreamed that we had entered into the spacious store in which the gifts of God to humanity are all kept. And we talked to the angel behind the counter, saying, we on earth have run out of the fruits of the Spirit. Can you restock us? Can you give us more fruit? When the angel seemed to say no, we cried out again in place of violence, terrorism, war, affliction, poverty, injustice. We need love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, humility, gentleness, faithfulness. 
Without these things, we shall be lost. But the angel replied, we do not stock any fruit here at all. We can give you some seeds. Seeds, not fruit. God promises to plant within us his kingdom life of love. We cannot take it for granted that unless we tend and nurture those gifts within us, the love will blossom and flourish. And it's all there right at the very beginning of the life story of Jesus. There's a remarkable poem by U.A. Fanthorpe which instructs us on the sacrifices that we sometimes all have to make and make our love stretch just a little bit further. Her poem tells us to fret less about purity, about perfection, about the things that we thought we should be or have, and to get on with the business of practically loving the world around us. The poem's called I Am Joseph, and it's about Joseph, of course, who is not the real father of Jesus. Here's the poem. I am Joseph Carpenter of David's kingly line. I wanted an heir, discovered my wife's son wasn't mine. I am an obstinate lover, love Mary for better or worse, wouldn't stop loving her when I found out someone came first. Mine was the likeness I hoped for when the firstborn man-child came, but nothing of him was me. I couldn't even choose his name. I am Joseph who wanted to teach my own boy how to live. My lesson for my foster son, endure, love, give. I am the true vine. You are the branches. But we are not the stem of the tree of the vine. We have been grafted in we have been drawn in to the love and grace of God, and in so doing, we are now able to manifest the love of God and the fruits of the Spirit. Today's gospel reminds us that though imperfect, flawed, undeserving, we are now grafted as wild branches into the true vine of Christ. Jesus' life and love will flow through us and me, the branches. We are to bear fruit, not for ourselves, but for others and the world. Fruit that will last, fruit that can feed, fruit that can become the good wine of the kingdom, and fruit that will nourish the poor and the hungry. And so today's gospel is simple. It draws on the Ethiopian eunuch, what one John says to us, the psalm celebrates and the gospel proclaims. Abide in God's love. Abide with others in their suffering and need and pain. Abide with one another in love. Let the life of Christ be fruitful in you for our needy world. Christ is the vine. You and I are the branches. He will keep abiding in you. Be fruitful. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.